Welcome to Real Estate Syndicator Live, episode 62, and uh, super excited to have my good friend Tim May, Tim Mai, Tim May or Tim Mai, depending on where you are. But uh, we're, today we're going to be talking about the proven strategies that uh, marketing strategies that top real estate syndicators and fund managers use to go from struggling to raising over $100 million on autopilot. And uh, before we bring my good friend Tim on, and before we talk about some of the proven strategies for attracting more investors to a real estate syndication, and before we talk about the top three mistakes real estate syndicators make in their marketing approach, I, I want to read, I don't usually do this, but I want to read Tim's bio because it's such a fascinating one. So uh, I'll do that and then I'll bring Tim on. But Tim, Tim Mai is the embodiment of the American dream, having survived a childhood that included war a dramatic escape from pirates at sea and languishing in a refugee camp. I definitely want to talk about uh, the escape from pirates. So if, you're, if you want to do that and talk about that a little bit later on, drop something in the chat. Uh, he's an industry leader who has acquired and exited well over $50 million uh, worth of real estate and currently a GP and LP in over 2,800 units of multifamily apartments. Tim has taught thousands of people how to get started in real estate and also has partnered with many passive investors to help them earn passive income and build generational wealth. Uh, Tim actually went from a complete unknown about a year ago or 13 months ago, where it shot to fame over the last year and now has a community of over 3,000 people. Uh, as a founder of Hero Wealth Partners and Hero Wealth Fund, Tim strives to provide his investors with stable cash flow and long-term capital appreciation by buying multifamily and other commercial real estates. Uh, and along with his many business accomplishments, he's also been very active in raising capital for charities, uh, which I think is really cool. He's obviously hosting the Capital Raising Summit this year in Houston in September, which I definitely want to talk about later on today. And Tim lives in Sugarland, Texas with his uh, high school sweetheart, wife, and two amazing teenage boys. So without further ado, uh, Tim, welcome to the show, my friend. Wow, that's that's an awesome intro, Mauricio. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm super pumped. I am super pumped, man. Let's get right into it. So one of the most common questions that people were providing us in uh, our community was, what are the proven strategies for attracting more investors? Everybody wants to get more investors into their real estate syndications. And I know you've got this sort of three-part, three phases as part of these marketing strategies. So why don't you go over those three phases, kind of high level, and then I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions. In fact, I really want this to be super interactive. So if you've got a question, please drop it in the chat and, and we'll get to it. But uh, Tim, why don't you just start a little bit with that big overview on sort of those big three phases that you, you, you talk about so often? Yeah, definitely, Mauricio. Yeah, and, and what I'm about to share is not just from my own capital raising experience, but from over the 50 of the top capital raisers in our industry that I've been able to interview in the last 13 months. Um, and so I've been able, you know, from all those interviews, I've been able to broke it down into three major phases when it comes to capital raising. Phase one is about getting known. Uh, um, phase two is about getting leads. So lead generation, and then uh, phase three is about getting capital. This is where you convert that lead into capital. Um, and so those are the three phases. Within those phases, you know, uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, getting known is about, uh, uh, you know, who the target, who your avatar is, being an authority, you know, putting yourself out everywhere. Uh, get leads is about, uh, you know, having a lead generation funnel, building your list, right? And then uh, getting capital is about, having nurturing sequences, automation sequences to convert them into calls, into book calls, and then, you know, closing them into your investments, into your syndications, your funds. Yeah. yeah. And talk, talk about on, on the first phase, the get known, talk about this, this concept of being an authority, right? Because this is probably one of my favorite things. A lot of questions about how to, how to use social media and podcasting. And this is really where being an authority can really play a big part in your raising capital. So talk a little bit about how somebody goes about, a, a, or actually maybe first start about what is uh, becoming an authority and then talk a little bit about how one becomes an authority and why it's so important. Right. Yes. And you're so glad that you bring this up because this is the, the missing part that I, that I see in all marketing books. Hardly anybody talk about this part of it. And it's so important. It's, it's like the biggest part of marketing that a lot of people miss. And being an authority is about Picking a niche that allows you to stand out very quickly, very easily. One of the, and I'll share my own experience in this one. One of the reasons that I, I was able to go from like 
uh, hardly anybody knew me in the syndication industry 13 months ago uh, to now have a community of over 3,000 people and doing all these things is because um, I decided to be to be an authority when it comes to capital raising. Now, I didn't have all the capital raising experience. I haven't raised the hundreds of millions of dollars that the people I interviewed did. But, be, but by positioning myself that way and then specifically strategically interview the people who have raised over 100 million, it, it, it elevated, so it's called borrower authority. So I borrowed their, their, their credibility and it elevated me in being known as a you know, top capital raisers very quickly. Um, and so, so it, it doesn't matter what niche that you decide, whether it could be like, it could be um, uh, passive investing for nurses, for example, right? But by picking a, a niche and, and an avatar like that and educate, this is the important part of being authority, you educate to that avatar and boom, they instantly see you as an authority. We've all been trained and brainwashed for at least 12 years of our lives to see our teachers at, as the authority. And so being an educator is a really great way of being that authority. Uh, being a book author is also another great way being a podcast host, a YouTube live, all of this, and you know, any ways that you are an educator, it's a big part of being an authority. Yeah. And, and to be clear too, because a lot of people ask me this about the legal part. So be, being the authority and adding value, which is really what you you just mentioned, which is so important because a lot of people just want to be the authority and, and sort of just pitch their deals or, or, or pitch whatever they have. But, but if you're in the business of adding value, then you can absolutely do that without being considered marketing your deal, right? One of the ways that you can still market and advertise, even if you're doing a 506B, is to do just that. Just add value. Pick your avatar, Right. And then go out there and, and, and add tremendous value from them so that you do become the, the authority. But you're not talking about your specific deal. Right, Tim? What are some of the Correct. things that, that you, you, you would recommend people talk about? Yeah. So like one of the things that my team and I do for our funds is we do webinars on introduction to multifamily. We uh, do uh, teach about due diligence. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing a course right now that uh, specifically for taking someone from a newbie investor into an investor in syndication. So it's a six week course that we're doing. So anything like that, anything that educates your investors, um, you, you can do that. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Because I mean, do, do you, in terms of podcasting versus social media versus writing a book versus uh, you know uh, putting all of the above, <laughs> <laughs> really, it, it really is. I mean, you know, you, yeah, you 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 can pick definitely when you're first starting out. You, you can pick one and go all in on that one, um, and then as soon as you can, and as soon as you have resources, uh, you, yeah. And a lot of times, the content that you're creating. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I do a weekly virtual meetup that I interview someone. Well, that number one, that virtual meetup creates a community. And then from that meetup, you know, we drive people into our Facebook group. So it builds our Facebook group. And then that interview, uh, I turn that into a podcast, um, the audio into a podcast, the video into our YouTube channel, and then, uh, you know, um, cutting up all the videos into reels. And so really like the, 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 one thing that you do can turn into a lot of different assets that you can put everywhere. Yeah, that's something I learned from from Gary V. Just he's a big believer in in trying to maximize what type of marketing you're doing. Do one pillar content, and from that, like we mentioned, we can do something like this. This is a video, right? But that can also be the audio can be stripped away. It can be a podcast. You can turn now with ChatGPT. I mean, all these AI tools. You can turn the transcript and turn it into a blog, which can be yep. a social media post. So you get all these sort of economies of scale by taking one piece of content and then chopping it up into into to many things. Uh, yeah. What, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add, like this book that I'm writing, this $100 million more, uh, capital raising secrets, uh, is from the interview. So I take the transcript of the interview, and I, I, I take out the main points, and I created an outline, nine chapters, nine steps, that I'm using to turn it in a book and chat GPT is also helping my helper in that <laughs> my co-writer. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think, and that's a great strategy. You know, one of my favorite books is think and grow rich. And that's exactly what Napoleon Hill did. He went out there and interviewed all these millionaires and probably now billionaires equivalent to, to now. And that's yep. how he came up with uh, with this book. It was just, it's a great way to, we actually were talking before we came on about a, just potentially even writing a book where you have one, all the people you've interviewed sort of as a, as a separate chapter. 
Um, so let's talk about the mistakes, right? Because I always like to, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the securities lawyer, right? So I'm always focused on mistakes and all that stuff. But uh, questions that came out in the Facebook group was, you know, what are the sort of the top three mistakes that real estate syndicators make when, when uh, with their, their sort of marketing approach in, in syndications? Right. Yeah. I think that the biggest one is not seeing themselves as a marketer. You know, they think that, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an operator. I'm a, I mean, if you're going to be in the business of raising money, uh, whether it's for your own deals or, you know, in, in coach GPs and funds, you have to put on that hat that you are a marketer. And what does it mean to be a marketer? Very simple. It just means that every single day, more people have to know what you do. That's it. So every single day, you got to think, well, how am I going to announce out there to more people of what I do. And so, so yeah, so, 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 you know, see yourself as a marketer every day, put out, you know, something, whether it's on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on wherever social media that you're at, um, or even if it's not social media, your phone contact right here, right? As adults, as adults, I guarantee you, our phone here has at least $10 million sitting in here. <laughs> so, you know, like money that's not working, money that's si sitting in, in savings account in CDs or even in, in, in IRAs that are just not working. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so, so every day your goal is to get, you know, at least one more person to know what you do and boom, you are in the marketing business. So that's number one. Tim, uh, before, you, before you go to number two, how often do you think people should be posting on social media? Is it you know, once a day, three times a day? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. It, you know, every platform's a little bit different. Um, you know, so, so you, you have platforms that are like TikTok, Instagram, those, you know, those you can post a lot more. I think it's common uh, for people to have a, formula of three posts on, on the short form type platforms. Uh, and then for longer type platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, it's gen generally people post one a day. But I, I don't want you to get caught up in the, the uh, number of times, but I want you to focus on the quality of what you're putting out. If you put out really good quality, even if it's just one a week, it, it will trump you putting out 100 a day any day, right? Uh, some of my Facebook posts that I make, um, you know, gets over a thousand comments. It's because wow. of the quality that that yeah. that it's being put out, not not the quantity. So you don't, yeah, don't don't yeah. always focus on quality. And one of the things I've noticed, especially like I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, I know you are too. But one of the things I've also noticed is, you know, maybe that first post of the day gets a lot more traction. But once you get to post number two or three of the day, it yeah. seems like the posts are competing for each other. It just seems that they don't get as much traction as that at least one a day. Then there's other platforms like YouTube, which I know you can you can post multiple videos a day and, right. and those videos aren't going to compete with you. So, okay, well, so one is make sure you're a marketer. By the way, that does remind me, Gary Vee has that great quote about like your business, you should look at your business as first a marketing company and then whatever you're doing. So if you're a syndicator, you're really a marketing company and then a syndicator, or you're a marketing yep. company and then a real estate investor or whatever. So, uh, so anyway, so be a market is number one. What about number two? Yeah. So num number two is like, you know, being, we, we talk about authority, so I'm not going to go to authority, but another good one was, would be omnipresence, like being everywhere all the time, all at once, right? <laughs> kind of like that movie everywhere all at once. Um, you really have to be that when it comes to marketing and, you know, uh, repurposing all of your content allows you to be that. Um, and then the, the uh, yeah, so that, so that would be the second one. Uh, the third one is just consistency, you know, making sure that whether, whether you, you know, you, like I said earlier, every single day, someone new has to know what you do every single day. Right. Um, and whether you're, you're doing that, your assistants helping you doing that, your VA is helping you doing that. But yeah, just just be super consistent. Uh, that's one and, of the things I. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Um, yeah. And, and, and people always ask me, it's like, Tim, how how are you able to, you know, to 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 I see you all the time and I see you everywhere. <laughs> um, I do. I do probably. 10% of it, 90% of it's done by my VAs. And so that, that's, that's, yeah. that, that's kind of what I was going to ask you because, you know, it, it's, you know, a lot of the pushback I get a lot of times, look, I'm busy. Like I've got a, I've got a full-time job. I'm, I've either got my own W2 and I'm doing this on the side, or maybe I'm a full-time syndicator, but I'm, I mean, I'm busy analyzing deal, analyzing markets. 
what do I, how do I get this much content out? Um, is, is VA kind of your first hire that you would recommend as soon as you can get a little bit of extra capital to help? hundred hundred percent. Oh my gosh. A VA, they are so inexpensive compared to what they can produce for you. Right. I mean, if you, if, yeah, if you could afford, you know, even 10 bucks an hour would be a really good VA already 10 bucks an hour. They will do magic wonders for you. They'll multiply your productivity by at least five times, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's, you know, that, that um, yeah, I, I would, as soon as you can, definitely. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, one of the other things that you mentioned, I think you were going to talk about it at your, uh, your capital raising summit, uh, this idea of attracting investors versus pursuing them. One of my favorite quotes uh, from Jim Rohn is actually it has to do with success, but it's, he says success is not something that you pursue. Success is something that you attract by becoming an attractive person. So if you're looking for something, just just improve yourself and attract that kind of stuff. Talk a little bit about that in the context of marketing, because you talk about this attraction, basically attraction marketing, which I think is super fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and it relates to everything we talked about. You know, you know, targeting like who 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 you're speaking to. You know, being an authority adding value to them, uh, you know, educating them, being everywhere, uh, you know, being that consistent. I have, I'll give you an example. You know, one of my investors that uh, recently invested in uh, one, of, one of my deals here reached out to me and said, hey, Tim, I have $500,000 sitting in my IRA, uh, not doing anything. Do you have any deals I can put money to? Like, I didn't call to this person. Uh, it's just because they see me, you know, out here, um, um, educating and, 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 you know, sharing. And so, yeah, that's, that's an example of an attraction marketing, right? So when enough people know what you do, they're going to ask you, right? Cause they see you as an expert. They see you as someone, you know, that they can uh, get advice on, uh, from on that particular topic. And so, so they'll come to you and they'll, they'll, they'll ask you. Uh, that's, that's great stuff. Um, Talk about the second phase. So you, you, your job is to get known, get out there on social media, do everything you can, be omnipresent, be consistent, which is a big one. So, okay, so now you've got traction on that. Your second phase was to get leads. So how do I, how do I go from putting myself out there every day, whether it's podcasting, writing a book, whatever, to actually getting the leads? Because ultimately that's what everybody wants. We want to add investors to our list so we can communicate with them and ultimately pitch them a deal. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, so we, we touch on a little bit about your, your phone, right? Your phone contact. Uh, one of the things I recommend you to do is categorizing them uh, on your phone. Uh, create, uh, I learned this from Russell Brunson, Dream 100. Basically identify 100 people on your phone list here that um, are already investors, uh, whether they invest in real estate or they invest in stocks, uh, they're high income owners, um, they, you know, they're, they're uh, successful business owners. So identifying, you know, these people that could be potential investors for you so that you take, you know, whatever your thousand, 2000 phone contacts, boil down to a hundred. And those are going to be your first hundred people that you're going to uh, target. And then past your 100, uh, just your Facebook friends alone, there's 5,000 of them, right? Um, if you don't have 5,000, go add more to get 5,000. But one of the things that I do a lot on Facebook, I'm active on Facebook, is I make these posts where I get people to raise their hands. So I'll give you an example. You know, um, uh, uh, here's, here's an example of something I would post. I'm thinking about doing a training on how to double your money within five to seven years. Uh, who'd be interested in, you know, uh, joining the Zoom call? And so, so people would then my face, you know, my Facebook friends would then raise their hands and say, "Yes, I'm interested. Yes, I'm interested." Well, guess what? All of those become leads for me. And then, you know, when I send them the Zoom link to register, now I capture their email, the phone, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and whatever other information. I even ask them like, "Are you a credit investor?" Things like that as well. Uh, but yeah, that's that's. Uh, so I call that mining social media. So Facebook is a great way to start that. And LinkedIn too. LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn allows you to have a lot more people, like thirty thousand connections, I think. And so, reaching out to all of your connections, um, and if you don't, uh, you know, have as many people connected, you want to start researching for. So I, I, I went to ChatGPT and searched for what are all the different types of um, doctors and dentists, you know, like all the different. Uh, um, 
specialist, right, uh, within the medical and dentist. Uh, and they gave, yeah, give me a big, really big list. And I did a research, uh, and I use a different tool, not LinkedIn, but I did a research and I found out that there are almost 1.5 million doctors uh, based on that. And so, yeah. so, yeah, so imagine you just take one of those and you search them. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, if you use Sales Navigator, it allows you to have a lot more search criteria. So I think it's an extra 100 bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. But you can find uh, doctors who are in the, the um, uh, real estate groups, right? So you join these you know, commercial real estate, like just real estate groups. And so doctors in real estate groups, those are really good people for you to add on as your contact, uh, as your connection. And then you know, ha start a conversation with them. Hey, I, you know, we're in this Facebook group, to we're in, not Facebook, we're in this real estate groups together. You know, uh, yeah, love to hear about your, your investing experience. So that's another way to get more leads. And these, all of these are free. Um, and then, yeah, like doing these kind of live. Um, the only thing I don't like about this YouTube live, Mauricio, is yeah, that yeah. you're not able to capture their, their contact information. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I do everything on uh, through Zoom. It's easy to capture it. But, uh, but, but I, you know, um, you can also use a Google form to capture it. And then after they fill out the form, then you give them the link to the live and stuff. Uh, so that way you can capture the contact information. But yeah, just making sure that everything you do have a way to capture that lead uh, so you can build your list. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways I'm, you know, again, my, my goal here with these lives is really just to add as much value as possible. I'm not necessarily looking to, to build a list, but one of the easy ways that you can do that with a live or even with a podcast, because that's the same problem with a podcast, right? You have a podcast yep. and everybody's just downloading it. How do you do that? And the way you do it is with, with your lead magnets. I mean, if you're looking to attract you know, doctors or whatever into your list, then you can put together a, a you know, a, a report or some kind of collateral of, you know, why, you know, why doctors don't get rich or, you know, how, how to, how to become, you know, financially free with a doctor. And then you can say, Hey, look, if you want a copy of this, just, you know, email me at, you know, doctors at mauricio.com or, or I'll put a link in the show notes. I mean, there are ways for you to capture if that's what you're really looking to do, but, uh, but no, I, I, I totally get it. Uh, I've got so many questions, Tim. Uh, I, I, if you guys, if you have questions, please, please drop them in the comments. And if you're getting value from this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can uh, get our uh, notifications also for next ones. But please, I can ask uh, Tim questions all day long, but uh, I want to make sure that we get the community. I really, that's the whole point. The point is to answer the questions for the community, not just me and be selfish. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, but uh, Doug says, uh, let's, let's see, Doug, Doug says, uh, good point on capturing leads via Zoom. I think LinkedIn events will do the same thing. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, lead, lead, lead capture. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on LinkedIn events? Have you done any of the lead captures there? I have not, I have not, but I, yeah, I haven't done any LinkedIn events, but I, I, I mean, I would assume it works very similar to Facebook events. And so, yeah, people will say, yes, you, you get their, you get their, their profile, but you don't actually get things like, you know, email phone number that they, they would give you to you. Yeah. So I think that's a little bit different. Yeah. Anything specific? Somebody in the Facebook group was asking how to get marketing in front of higher net worth individuals. Does that, in your opinion, is that, you know, based on the type of lead magnets you produce? So if you're looking for higher net worth, I know I saw some slides from you that there are, you know, there are some companies that only yeah. want to deal with, you know, people who have $500,000 in, yep. in, in income. T talk a little bit about the strategy yeah, yeah, yeah. of really, really narrowing down on that avatar. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, finding people with net, net worth, uh, two things, right? Number one, like knowing who they are so you can target them. Like we just mentioned about the doctors, right? So if you're targeting surgeons, you know, they have good money. <laughs> right. uh, I've never, I've never met a broke surgeon before, but uh, they might, they probably exist, but um, you know, and then, and then uh, number two, yeah, you're messaging, you're messaging. So there's a company called Fisher Investments. I think they are at 20 something billion dollars as an under management. Uh, it's a lot of billions that they have. And their marketing, marketing message is this. If you have $500,000 uh, or more, there you go. Yeah. If you have $500,000 portfolio, you know, uh, download these, this guide and, and they change what what guide, what report those things are, but they always start their message with, if you have $500,000 portfolio. So, so that's a really good way to call out the people 
that you're looking for that have you know that 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 have the money that you want. So one of the things that I um uh I'm I'm working on right now, and I'm I'm actually gonna run some some uh some uh ads to this to test it. But I'm calling out people who uh, have at least a hundred thousand uh, dollars in tax liability or more. So if you paid a hundred thousand dollars or more on your taxes last year, uh. You know, yeah, blah blah blah, right? So that blah blah could be. I'm I'm teaching them how to convert their tax liability into an uh, a wealth building uh, vehicle, and so so by calling out people who have a hundred thousand dollars in tax liability, I already know they made good money <laughs> up to own hundred thousand dollars in taxes. <laughs> right, right. And how and how do you know if all of this is working, right? Chris in our Facebook group, uh, and by the way, if you haven't, uh, if you're not a member of the Facebook group, uh, the Real Estate Syndicator Facebook, I highly recommend. A lot of great people. It's MauriceRoll.com forward slash FB group. Uh, we got up. not as many as you, uh, Tim, since you're the marketing genius, but uh, really great community there. Uh, a lot of people helping each other out. But um, how do you how do you know if it's working? Because Chris was asking, like you, you're posting on social, you're doing all this stuff, but you're getting the wrong people to comment and you're not quite sure if what you're doing is working. What's the feedback mechanism that we should be looking yeah. at? Well, so so that's why I like to do engagement posts, right? And this is the you know, this is an extra mistake that a lot of people don't do when it comes to social media is directly asking for the engagement. So don't just make a post that is passive. If you want, if you want to gauge your, your your effectiveness, you have to ask them to like it. You have to make comments, say yes, say whatever, do something. And by them raising their hands and interacting with your gauge that uh, your post, that's how you have the engagement. And then because I, I like to send everything into a lead capture, well, the number of opt-ins I get also tells me. So I do a weekly virtual meetup. And so every week we have more people that register for it and also more people that attend it. So that also gives me, um, you know, uh, um, metrics that I know I'm growing and same thing with like Facebook group uh, if you growing your Facebook group by 100 a week you know it's growing right so so right. so yeah those things give you real measurement yeah well good and, and I, I got a couple questions here from the chat uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about your event coming up but uh, they're kind of related so I'm going to put both of them up here Susan asks can you discuss general solicitation and the prohibition in terms of the SEC 506b and then uh, Dave was actually also asking, uh, Tim, are you raising funds under 506B or 506C? Tim, why don't you ask that, answer that question first, and then I'll, I'll comment on uh, general solicitation under 506B. Yeah, so um, most of my deals so far right now has been we start with a B and then we convert to a C. Um, and so, so it's both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if uh, and I think I just did a video on that. I, I've done several, but I, my last video on the YouTube actually talks about that conversion of going from a 506 B to a 506 C, which a lot of people don't don't know how to do. But when it comes to this issue of you know general solicitation in a 506 B deal, remember 506 B, and I'll take not to take the spotlight away from you, Tim, but just to answer this real quick so everybody's on the same page. Uh, in a 506 B, you obviously cannot generally solicit or advertise, and so what we're talking about here is that the SEC allows you to do two things, right? One one, and under a 506B. One is you can always talk about you, your, yourself, and your company on these posts, right? So there's nothing wrong. SEC recognizes that you have to you know, continue running your business and you've got to do all this stuff, so that's great. But the other thing you can do is do these value-add posts. So even if you're doing a 506B, especially if you're in between deals, that's really when I would recommend doing this. But if you don't have an active deal, nothing wrong with putting out content, educating people as to why real estate's the greatest asset class in the world or why Florida's a great market to invest in or why mobile home parks or why this or why that or do a podcast and just, just add value to your investors, get those lead captures, which is what uh, Tim's been talking about, and then doing the final step, which we'll talk about here in a second, Tim, uh, which, is, uh, which is get the capital. So uh, it, it is allowed. You're not, you're not specifically advertising for your deal. What you're doing is you're just adding value to investors so that you can add them to your list so that when you do have a deal, that's when you're actually uh, communicating them because you're establishing, remember, you've got to establish that pre-existing subsistence relationship. So you get that, that email contact, start talking to them, start finding out whether they're sophisticated or not, go through that process that we've talked about many times, and then eventually you, they'll be eligible for your 506B deals. Um, uh, Mitchell says, um, let's do it here real quick. What Mitchell had a great idea. Mitchell, I've only focused on LinkedIn to this point, but those are most professionals in my own industry and not high net worth individuals who want to be LPs. Maybe more of an effort should be on Facebook or Twitter. 
Is that, is that your experience, Tim? Or do you, do you find like there's a lot no. more professionals on LinkedIn or do you think there's a lot of passive investors there? Well, there's definitely a lot of passive investors on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn because you can target whoever you want very easily. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, no, I, I, if, if, if you're on LinkedIn, use that. Don't, don't go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you just have to target, right? Like I said, you know, uh, whether it's going to be doctors or lawyers, whoever that is that you want to target, um, you can target them at the message connection and then start a conversation with them. Uh, you can post content that would, you know, that, that bring value to you, to them. And, and, and yeah. And you can also, one of the things that I, uh, I did was a virtual summit specifically for passive investors. Uh, and out of that summit, it was a three day virtual summit, a lot of work, <laughs> three day virtual, virtual summit, but we signed up uh, 1200 people registered for that summit. So it's like, you know, it's, yes, it's a lot of work, but you know, I got 1200 leads out of that. And we promoted that on LinkedIn a lot. Uh, to the you know target audience will, that that I wanted to go after. Yeah, and I think that's the key, right? The key is to to I just be very crystal clear on who your avatar is. I mean, I, look, I do the same thing. Like if I write a report, you probably read these reports because I've been out there for a while. But if I write a report, which I have called the eight critical steps to practicing safe syndication, or you know the five things every syndicator must know to stay out of jail, who do you think is going to request that report? It's not going to be you know, somebody who wants to invest in gold and silver or is in the crypto. I mean, it's going to be literally syndicators are going yep. to be interested in that. And that's how you you specifically draw out whatever the specific uh, avatars that you're looking for. But I agree. LinkedIn's got a little bit of everything. Uh, and again, one of my things that I've been focusing on lately is this idea of and like it, it, why or why is it Facebook yep. or LinkedIn? It. Why not Facebook and LinkedIn and you know, whatever, TikTok and, you know, Instagram, whatever, no reason to sort of limit yourself uh, doing that. Um, uh, Tim, uh, Maya, uh, Mayura asks, do you operate a fund? If so, what is the minimum? If not, is that a recommend, recommended path for syndication? Yeah, so funds funds require, you know, fund in syndication, people look at the deal, uh, they make the decision based on the deal. In a fund, a lot of times, especially when it's a blind fund, they're looking at your you, you as the fund manager. They look at your credibility, your experience, uh, and so fund is not a place that I would recommend you to go first. If it's if you're new to the the, the business, uh, start with syndications or or an, uh, or a they call it an SPV fund, a specific purpose vehicle fund, uh, which is for a specific property. That's fine. But for when it comes to blind funds, which is one of the things that I'm uh, launching right now. Um, now, in my case, I, I, uh, my fund is a Houston multifamily fund. So while it's not a very specific deal, people already know what type of property we're going after and even where that property is, right? Uh, and so, so that, um, yeah. That, uh, and, and my fund is a fund of funds. And so we're raising money. And then from there, we, you know, we invest into top, uh, top operators. Um, I don't, does that? Yeah, I, I, I think that that you question. actually did. And I think one of the one of the important things to remember, uh, Mayura, is that from my experience, and again, we do hundreds, we see hundreds of these, and we, we're doing a lot of funds uh, currently. It's a lot easier to raise money for a project specific deal than for a fund. I yep. I agree with Tim. I would not recommend starting a fund uh, if you're just starting out or this is your second or third deal. Usually, fund managers are people who've been doing this for a while. They've got their audience, they've, they've become the authority, they can literally put out, like to your point, hey, I'm doing a Houston fund, and people already know about them, they've already invested previously. And so unless you have, the, the only exception to that, and we do have a lot of clients who have huge social media following, yep. huge YouTube 100%. or huge Instagram, then it's a little bit different. So I do have some clients who have never done a syndication before, but because they have that audience, which again, goes back to that phase one, that all yep. important strategy, which is, become the authority because people tend to invest with people they know, like, and trust. And if you're an authority out there, you've got a big following, then people tend to think they know you. That may not be true. They may not know you at all, but uh, I've got plenty of clients who have not met their, 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 uh, their, their investors. And I, and we always joke that, that, you know, if, if they wanted them to watch their kids, they'd, they'd be happy to have them come over and watch the kid, even though they don't really know them in person. So uh, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, Mitchell asks, uh, should I start a separate social media account for these efforts or use my personal profile? That's a great question. Uh, use your personal, I mean, especially when it comes to social media, uh, you know, people like to do business with another individual. Uh, so definitely use your profile. Uh, even, uh, so Facebook favor pages a lot now, you know, Facebook go through different phases of 
uh, whether they favor, they want to bring more traffic to groups or pages. They, they, they're, they're driving a lot of uh, traffic to pages now. But even on your Facebook page, it should be your personal name. Um, you know, because that you, you know, people invest in you, like the individual, not you know, um, until you build a big enough name, then they invest into your company because you're the the leader of that company. But but especially in the beginning, people invest in you, and so yeah, uh, I I recommend to always use your your personal name. Yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. I mean, uh, people want to deal with individuals, not corporations. So I would highly yep. recommend. And to Tim's point, even if you have a business page, which you're right, Facebook has. I, I think they got kind of screwed with that change that happened a couple of years ago, and so they, they were kind of losing traffic. So they really have put an emphasis on their pages, which used to be nobody used to do pages anymore. You'd put out a post there, nobody would watch it, or nobody nobody would reach it. But uh, that's definitely coming back. But I agree. Start start with your personal. Once you get to a level where people know you, if you want to then venture out into into different things, uh, th that should be that should be fine. Uh, Tim, did we did we answer the question about how how do we measure success on on your marketing? Like, how do I know? You know, Chris is out there posting on LinkedIn, social media. Like, how do I know if it's working? How do I know if I should be changing my strategy? Uh, what's some of the feedback loops you're looking at? Yeah, like I said, you know, um, work on your engagement posts, right? Post that specifically ask for engagement. Uh, so when I'm doing a lead magnet post, if I don't get at least 50 people to say, yes, I want it. I know that that, that wasn't a good, uh, it wasn't either, it wasn't a good lead magnet or I just didn't write the headline well enough uh, for it to be good. And so, uh, so yeah, so like things like that will give you measurable results. That's good stuff. Uh, there's a question here in the Facebook group about uh, the difference between marketing and priming the market. And I think that's more of a, of a legal question. So maybe, maybe now let's talk about it real quick right now. Um, so I think what they're talking about is conditioning the market. And again, con conditioning the market is something that you just can't do if you're doing a 506B. I think what we're talking about primarily is either you're doing a 506C, so you're allowed to go pitch and do all the marketing you want, or you're doing a 506B, but you're just talking about value add to whatever your avatar is. The minute you start talking about your deal, start talking about you know anything that drums up interest in your potential deal, that's going to be called conditioning the market. But conditioning the market is a form of marketing, and it's just not allowed under a 506B. You can condition the market all day long if you're uh, if you're doing a 506C. Yeah, uh, right. case yeah. case studies case studies is a great way to to condition without because uh, you in a case study you're using a past deal, um, and you're not raising money for that deal. That deal already closed. You're just educating them on how you know how to deal, you know how you found the deal, what you did to the deal. Those kind of you know those things will will help um, condition your audience, right? Priming your audience for being interested in investment property, investing opportunities with you. Yeah, no, absolutely, guys. If you got any more questions, pop them in the comments so I don't just ask all of the questions that I'm interested in asking. But uh, while we ask, let's wait for some more comments here. But in the meantime, let's talk about briefly about your upcoming event. You've got a, a capital raising summit. I was just checking out the speakers and man, that's a pretty impressive list. Uh, you know, Ben and Ferris, I know really well. and They're just outstanding uh, capital raisers. You know, Dan Hanford's obviously really well. And I get all of these guys have done something really well, which has been become the authority, right? Dan set up yep. his own. He has his own events. He's got a great social media presence. Pridger, is a fun guy, a fund guy, has been popping out of nowhere. Uh, and again, just on the marketing side, you know, Ryan Gibson, Mike, uh, Michael uh, Gunthry, who I know was there last year as well. Just a really amazing uh, group of speakers that you've able to uh, to uh, assemble. You, you want to spend two minutes and talking a little bit about about the uh, about this event? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So Capital Raising Summit, CapitalRaisingSummit.com. It's happening on September 14th to 16th here in Houston, Texas. Uh, we did our first event last year in December in Dallas. We had over 150 people that attended. This year, we're expecting uh, a little bit over 300 people that are attending. And uh, and it's a new, it's you know it's it's like a it's more of a mastermind event more so than a seminar type event. Why why is that? Because the way we structure our event, uh, you sit in round table seating styles, and every session. We force you to move to a new table to sit with a new set of attendees, <laughs> and then you mastermind at your table. Um, and uh, and yeah, so we do that throughout the event. And the, with the goal is that by the end of the event, you would have met with everybody. And we even do this game with uh, uh, Blue Ben and Red Ben. 
uh, blue band means you're an introvert. Uh, red band means you're you're an extrovert. You're sexy. That's why it's red. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 and it works, by the way, because I was there last year. Obviously, I had the pleasure of speaking. Uh, we, I think we talked about fund and funds and funds. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about this, this, this time around. But yeah, the, the way it's set up where everybody sits around a table and you get to, you're forced to sit with different people. And I thought that was a really good way for you to meet everyone because that's the whole idea is to go. And, yeah, yes, the actual content is important, but you also want to network and, and, and meet as many people as you want. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and hold on, yeah. one, one more thing, Mauricio, about the event. So we just confirmed today. That's why his his uh, his uh, picture is not on our website yet. Um, um, who's, who's joining? Who's, who is it? Who yes. Is it? <laughs> yes, Paul Hutchison. He is the founder of Bridge Investments. Um, they are a forty billion dollar real estate fund. They're one of the twelve companies that buy directly from Fannie Mae. So they sit in the same table with BlackRock and stuff. Anyways. He is coming to speak. <laughs> Yay. And uh, fun, fun facts, fun facts. He is the major funder and executive producer of the uh, movie that's super hot right now. Um, they, um, oh my gosh, the name of the movie just escaped me. <laughs> the Sound of Freedom. The Sound of Freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so, man, it's going to be amazing. Yes. That's cool. And uh, this is not an affiliate link or anything, but if, if you go to capitalraisingsummit.com, uh, if you want to enter the promo Mauricio23, I think you get a discount for now. I will yeah. be there. What is it? $300? Uh, $300 off right, right now. Yep. Cool. Cool. And yeah, um, you want to sign up before uh, July 31st here. Okay. For that $300 discount. Sweet. Uh, did we touch about, let's go to phase three then. So phase, let's just a recap. So phase one is to, to get, get known, do whatever it takes to get known, become an authority, do all the things we've talked about. From there, you want to capture those leads, right? You want to turn that authority and that, those posts into a list because at the end of the day, that's what we want to yep. do. Uh, and uh, But let's get to number three, which is actually, how do you actually get the capital? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. So uh, yeah. let's get the capital and then let's finish answering questions. If you've got questions, pop, pop them in the chat. We'll get to them. But uh, how do we actually yeah. get the capital now that I'm the authority? I've got my list. Now what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So three major ways that that you know people in our industry get capital is number one, they get everyone on their list to book a call with them, right? So that way, either they themselves or the investor relations people get on the phone and convert that into invested capital. So that's number one. Uh, the second type is hosting webinars, uh, webinars to pitch a specific deal. Um, that we call them uh, conversion events, right? Events that uh, you know that 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 gets them to want to invest with you. Uh, so whether it's a specific deal, and I've also seen uh, you know webinars that are really well done. They're educational webinars, but it also gets them like very. They they almost get on a hot list, not a not a soft commit, but a hot list that hey, I want to be the first to be notified about your next investments. Um, and then the third one. Uh, that I see done way more than I thought before I got into this industry is co-GPing with other people. Uh, that uh, you know, that's a very common. So you want to be a part of an, you want to build your alliance or join an existing alliance of other people that either have deals or have a network, um, and you guys partner up with each other, and uh, yeah, and 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 you know, partner partner up as uh, co-GP and raise money that way. Yeah, them are fighting words though, Tim. Because I, I, I know, know. it's it's a, it's a very controversial topic. The co GPs, because even though you're absolutely right, the co GPing is a really great way, especially if you're new, right? Especially if you've never done a deal before, but you've got kind of a you've got a following and you want to get your feet wet. The challenge is you've got to be doing actual work with the co GP. What yep, I see 100%. so so many people do, which is the the number one sin in co GPing, is they're not doing anything. They're literally just raising capital as the co GP bring in their investors, bring in money, and then they're not doing much. Or maybe they're doing a little investor relations, which probably doesn't cut it. So just as a reminder, the three things that you've got to keep in mind with co-GPing is number one, you can't get paid transaction-based compensation. So your cut of the GP can't be based on how much money you bring in or even how how much, uh, whether you bring in money. Number two, you're, you've got to be performing substantial duties, which I know is a very vague term, but you know, let's, we'll, we'll leave that for another video. But you've got to be doing substantial work. And your primary role, it's number three, your primary role needs to be doing those substantial duties. You've got to spend more time working as the co-GP as opposed to just going to raise money. Because again, if you're just raising money and then once the deal closes, 
you know, you're pretty much done or you're just kind of, you're, you're there in, in spirit, that may be problematic. But webinars is interesting because, you know, when I, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, you know, so you see all the gray hair, but when we started, a lot of people were not doing webinars. And I've seen that the, over the last five, six, seven years, the evolution of the webinar has become more and more popular. Uh, I guess it's because it's become pretty, pretty effective. Tim, is that your experience? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, we probably borrowed the webinar from the internet marketing war over, because <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I, I started doing webinars back in 2016, I think. When go to webinar first oh, launch, <laughs> so I go back that far uh, with webinars. But uh, but yeah, webinars is a super super effective tool, uh, you know, uh, presentation um, styled. And so so yeah, definitely. Um, I I didn't know that it's new to this industry. So that's that's good to I know because you're coming from that from that other great industry. Uh, Epic Florida Homes asks, uh, what do you do to to uh, what do you do to a co GP that ends up not doing anything but promised a lot in the beginning? You know, that's well, let's answer that from two perspectives. One is my perspective, which is illegal, but Tim, have you faced those situations before where you've got a co GP and they said, Hey, I'm going to be able to do XYZ? You start the deal and then it turns out they failed miserably. What, what do you do from a from a just a strategic standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, you 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 find out if it's their first race. Just expect that they're not going to be able to raise anything. <laughs> so coming in knowing that if it's their first race, know that, okay. Uh, and then and then if it's not their first race, like look, give me a you know give me a number that you are super confident that you'll be able to you know to, to raise, and like really um, uh, hold them accountable to that, right? And so I think the the you know as long as you set up the expectation and say, look, whatever number you give me, make sure it's a number you can actually perform on. Uh, that 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 will help. <laughs> yeah, and you know, from a legal standpoint, this is kind of the the gray, not even the gray, the, the tricky, slippery slope. Because again, you you're you can't get compensated based on how much money the raise. So you've got to be super comfortable. Remember, the reason you're really bringing in under the law, why you're bringing a co GP in there, is to help you with the syndication, right? Ir irrespective of yes, incidental to everything, they can raise money for you. But ultimately, they should be doing something. So whether they don't raise any money or not, they should be still adding tremendous value for you maybe they're the boots on the ground or maybe yep. they're you know they're they're doing the due diligence or or they're asset managing or whatever something yep. that's substantial so even if they didn't bring in a dime uh then it shouldn't really matter and that's one of the reasons that we really highly recommend when you're bringing in co-gps to have some kind of an agreement ahead of time we say look these are there's four of us five of us here are the roles that we are each going to do we write them down there we and, and, and this is how much gp we're going to get based on these roles i'm going to be the you know doing the acquisitions and the due diligence and you're going to do the walkthrough you're going to do asset management i'm going to do investor relations and split everything up based on that beforehand ideally you get that signed sort of docu sign so it's that's stamped so that nobody can then come back in the future and say wait a minute this is you know th this person's really getting paid to raise capital and that's why they're getting 13 percent of the gp you can always go back to that document and say, no 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 even before we started raising capital, this was already predetermined. But that's that's one of the challenges with with co GPs is that if you really are bringing them just to raise capital, first of all, that's going to end up as you, right. you're acting as an unlicensed broker. But then the challenge is, uh, you know, what do you do at that yeah. point? Because because uh, that's that's one of the issues. So I have another thing to add to this, and I, I start to see this uh, playing out with the bigger uh, the bigger players, the bigger syndicators now. So. Uh, they're only taking on fund of funds and not even doing code GPs anymore. So um, uh, Vice 48 is uh, is one of the ones I see doing like leading this conversation. And same thing, I'm talking to other um, other top syndicators about the same topic. But so you can't come in as a code GP. You have to come in as a fund of funds, and you have to pay for the fund of funds, you know, document, which uh, I think for them it's like 8,500 bucks, right? And so if you are skin in the game, $8,500, and you come in as a fund of funds, so you don't need to, you know, your, your fund is just going to come in as an LP uh, position. You might have a different, you know, uh, uh, class of shares, but you're coming as an LP. And so you don't need an active role in the deal itself, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I do see that this is going to be um, more and more common. Uh, which keeps it very legal. I'm sure Mauricio would love that <laughs> that it's <laughs> it's legal. And you as the you as the lead sponsor, you know you um, yeah you uh, if someone's willing to pay eighty five hundred bucks to create the document, you know that they're gonna 
raise enough money to at least cover that. <laughs> yeah. So look, I, I, I definitely think that, and that was my topic of my talk uh, when I spoke at your event last year, the of real estate funds and then fund of funds. Fund of funds is a great model. The only tricky part is, and again, I've done, check out the YouTube channel. There's a lot of videos that we've done on fund of funds. It's just, there's a whole lot more compliance than just 506B, 506C. We always talk about that level of compliance, you know, register, find an exemption or it's illegal. You're doing 506B. Right? Now you're entering into a whole new can of worms um, in terms of compliance. You want to make sure you're working with somebody who knows all that stuff. The biggest one, it just depends on what state you're in because you, you're going to be an investment advisor and the question is going to be, do you need to register? Now, we don't have time to get into all of that. But if you're thinking about doing a fund of funds, I agree. I prefer it 100 times more than being a co-GP because it eliminates all of the gray area. Are you, are you getting compensated to raise capital? Here, you're actually raising money to your own fund. So yep. you are getting paid, but you've got to add value as well to your investors. So you're going to be doing due diligence. You're going to be negotiating better terms. You're going to be, you know, not only doing due, due diligence on the property, but you're going to be doing due diligence on the sponsors. You're yep. going to be cutting better deals. There's a bunch of things that you need to be doing so that you're getting compensated for adding value to your investors who are busy professionals. They don't have time to go do all of this. Uh, but fund of funds, I agree, is a really good, uh, a good way to do that. Uh, we're almost at the end here, but I, I do, uh, I'm going to skip the legal, uh, two seconds on this maybe, uh, somebody was asking about the, the legal ramifications if you end up doing this wrong. Look, if you end up doing the, the, doing the marketing wrong, all that really happens is you, you're not able to com comply with the, the exemption, right? If you're doing a 506B and you end up marketing, then you can't rely on 506B, so you end up generally with an unregistered offering. because you, you have to register it, find an exemption, you don't have an exemption. You're kind of screwed and you have an unregistered offering and generally speaking the exposure there is is restitution you've got to give uh your investors their money back plus uh plus interest which is is never fun because we're not really in the business of um of guaranteeing our investors money which is really what you're doing when you're violating uh securities laws uh let's wrap it up with a couple of questions here mb flu says what if what if i have my own personal portfolio and i want to offer that to investors through a syndication have you done any of those uh i have not done any of those no I call that I call those reverse syndications uh, where you're you're basically offering your own properties. I love it, especially if you're a first time syndicator. It's a great way to get started. Uh, you've just got to disclose. Obviously, there's all these potential conflicts of interest. You know, why are you selling it? You know, what's wrong with it? But it's got a lot of benefits, right? You know where all the skeletons are in the closet. You know all the numbers. There's going to be no surprises that hey, the roof needs uh, repairing that you didn't know of, or uh, you know the the rent rolls aren't accurate. So it's a really great way to get started. And there's nothing wrong with you syndicating even 80% of that portfolio and keeping 20%, as long as your open kimono is in your documents and letting everybody know that, um, that that's what you're doing, that's a great, it's one of my favorite ways to get started. One was one that you mentioned, Tim, which is just hop on somebody's coattails, right? Go and work with an experienced indicator, get your feet wet. But the other one is take an existing property. There's no pressure to close when it's your own deal. That's another beautiful yep. thing. Right? You can raise the money and, and there's, no, there's no pressure. Um, all right, Tim. I got to hear this pirate story. I have not heard it. And I, I was reading your bio. So, so tell me about the uh, you escaping pirates. I think this happened when you were young, right? Right. Yeah. So if you ever heard of the term Vietnamese boat people, I'm one of those. What does that mean? It's um, so after the war ended in 1975, the communist government took over and you can't just leave Vietnam. You have to, uh, if you want to leave, you have to escape out of Vietnam. And so from 1975 to 1992, uh, 1992 is when they, they shut down all of the refugee camps. So you can't, even if you leave Vietnam, there's no place for you to go. Um, and so, so from, from that time period, a lot of people escaped out of Vietnam. Um, my whole family had tried to escape out of Vietnam um, a number of times, but it wasn't successful. So when my brother turned 18 and, Back then, when you, when a boy turns 18, there's automatic draft into uh, the military. And so a lot of boys escape out um, or they chop up their index fingers so they can't pull the trigger. Um, and wow. so, yeah. So so when my brother turned 18, you know, my, my parents wanted for him to try to escape out again. And he didn't want to go alone. So he asked if I want to come along. As an 11-year-old, I, I, you know, I was like, sure, I'll come along. Uh, we, we always come back home anyways. I didn't know we were going to make it out. But, uh, but yeah, so we, um, uh, you know, we got on this little fishing boat. It's, you know, I mean, um, it's a, 
I don't know how big it is, uh, but probably no more than 30 feet. Uh, and uh, yeah, I there were 37 of us. I was the only child on the boat. Um, the wait, me there's and, wait, wait, there's 37 of you on a 30 foot boat. Yeah, it's wow. like it, we were laying like sardines, like literally, <laughs> like wow. um, be, be, because yeah, because you, you if you if you if you go on a boat that's too big. Uh, it's easy for them to notice you, uh, and so yeah, like it's it, anyways. But we literally did lay like sardines <laughs> on on that boat, um, and um, you know, and and my um, yeah. So 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 anyways, we floated out at sea for seven days and six nights, and this is just going from Vietnam to the uh, Malaysia. Now you probably can take a speedboat and you get there in you know less than a day. <laughs> um, and on the um, uh, yeah, on the fourth day, we got hijacked by five pirate boats. Uh, so pirate boats, these are uh, Thai fishermen that you know when they when they uh, when they hijack your boat, they'll rape the woman, uh, they'll take whatever valuable they can, and sometimes they'll even you know you know kill um, uh, the you know throw the man off the boat. Uh, my luckily for us. That didn't happen. They took whatever valuable they they could and left us on our way. But my sister-in-law's family, uh, my brother's wife, uh, the brother I came to the U.S. with, uh, in 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 their escape out of Vietnam, uh, her 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 dad and two brothers, um, you know, uh, pass away in that in that journey. Um, and so it is a very dangerous uh, route to to go. And uh, so yeah, so I um. I landed in um, the Malaysian refugee camp, and then from there we applied to get you know into the U.S. Uh, back then, the U.S. was very open to accepting young people, uh, and so because we you know we were young enough, so it's uh, we we accept we we apply and got in. And so when I got here to the U.S., I was 12 years old. My brother was 19. Two boys on the street. We live in a a a, um, a C class, uh, Section Eight housing apartment, wow. and uh, yeah, it was uh, it's funny. Yeah, because now when I walk some of these properties, like, oh wow, this one's just like the one I was at. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing story. I hadn't heard that before, but uh, and look where you are now. Now you're you're a, a master marketer. You're uh, hosting this amazing conference that uh, we've got on. Uh, what are the dates again? It's uh, September, September 14th, 16th. Great. Yep. 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 And yeah. uh, so, so uh, I'll wrap this yep. up real quick here. Capitalraisingsummit.com. Put the promo code in there. Get yourself a discount. Uh, any final thoughts, Tim? Yeah, you know, just uh, go out there, be a part of the community, right? And learn from from you know, learn. I mean, that's one of the things I I, I absolutely love about this industry that that um, doesn't exist as much in the single family home space, which is where I came from. It's all the partnerships that get done in this in this business this business because the numbers are bigger you're forced to play together and partner up and so yeah go out there be a part of a community you know network with each other do deals with each other um and yeah and let's all grow you know grow together that's cool and tim you're, you're a part of my uh facebook group the real estate syndicate alive but you've also got your own facebook group uh what's the name of that Yes, Capital Raising Nation. So if you go capitalraisingnation.com, it will redirect you to the uh, Facebook group. And then my weekly virtual meetup is called Capital Raising Party. So if you go capitalraisingparty.com, it will take you there. Awesome, Tim. Hey, thank you so much, Tim. I'm really looking forward to your event, uh, September 14, 16. I've always, I've obviously, we'll be there. We'll figure out a great topic to speak. And uh, if you haven't checked out his uh, Facebook group and his community, I highly recommend it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, I please do so and join us in the Syndicator Community Facebook group. And we'll see you next week with Alex Kogan, who's going to be our guest uh, talking about the current uh, landscape of the real estate market. Uh, until next time, thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Mauricio. Thanks, thanks everyone. Tim. See you. Thanks.